It's time for scripture lesson. Scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. And he said, meaning Jesus, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, we are going to listen to Jesus one more time. In particular, we are going to listen to the parable of the lost son, as known as the prodigal son. In the story of the prodigal son, we see the four stages of faith journey in every believer of Christ. I can identify, as I said, the following four. The first one is this, rebellion which means turning away from God and declaring independence of God and from God. The second stage is realization. When we all hit the rock bottom. Third one is repentance. Repentance means not only feeling remorseful, but also return to the Lord. The last one is restoration to God's family, and there's joy in heaven. I would call this four R's in the gospel of Christ. Let's check them out one by one. First one is rebellion. The story, the parable, begins with the younger son who declared of his independence to his father, like this, Father, give me my inheritance. I am going solo. Likewise, when we were outside the salvation, and when we did not know Christ, we all declared our independence to God, our Heavenly Father. Independence of God and from God means that we refuse to be under the control of God. We choose to be in charge of our own lives, rejecting God. We want to be the king in our lives. 
Did you know that's exactly how and where sin starts? Here's an example. I'm sure you're familiar with the Genesis chapter 3 story where Satan, in disguise of what? Serpent, approached Eve and asking the question, is that true that when you ate this forbidden fruit, you shall surely die? What he was trying to do was to attempt Eve to sin. What was he saying? He was saying that you don't need God in your life. Actually, when you eat this fruit, you will become like God yourself. In other words, he was inviting Eve to be her own God in her life. That's how sin came in. I remember in my high school days, right after, less than a year after I became a Christian, I was talking with a friend of mine who also was in Sunday school with me, high school, same grade. And he told me, he sort of confided in me and confessed me that you know, he was about to quit the church. I said, why? I'm just starting and now you're quitting. And he says, Geyun, let me tell you, I feel so much trapped. I feel there are too many rules and regulations in the church. So he declared his own independence from God and his church. Did you know that such rebellion against God and declaration of independence to God is called sin in the Bible? Sin not only covers when we break the rules and when we violate the Ten Commandments, stealing, you know, lying and cheating and killing and all kinds of things, but also even though they're perfectly fine morally, but if you say that I don't have, uh, want to have anything to do with God and Christ, I am my own God, that's sin. In fact, everyone is born with such, uh, we call human depravity, tendency, you know, to sin and to be independent of God. Now, Isaiah 53, 6 says this, All, meaning the humans, like you and me, we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. When we insist that I'm going my own way, when I'm going my own way, we, you know, go astray from God, and that's rebellion. The second stage is this. What happened to this prodigal son? For a while, after he left home, he had money, the prodigal son had a great time. Nobody told him what to do. He did everything he wanted to do, and he sought after, quote-unquote, the loose life here filled with drinking, women, gambling, and partying with bad company. Well, as you guessed right, all the money has dis disappeared rather fast. To make things worse, there was a severe famine in the land, in the region where the prodigal son was. He then had to support himself. So he got a job. Not a decent one, I must say, but a pig herd. You see, he was a Jewish man. In Jewish mindset, that was a worse job ever. Below human dignity, you'd rather die than being a pig farmer. Even with that lowest job, things were not that easy. The famine in the land was so severe that it made everyone struggle and many starving. The prodigal son didn't get paid on time. In fact, no one was giving him anything. Not a single thing. Even the food. He was so hungry that he tried to feed himself with pods, the pig food. However, even with that, it was not easy to get. That's when he finally came to realize how miserable he was. 
He hit the rock bottom, so to speak. So he realized that he couldn't go on like that forever, and he missed, indeed, good old days in his home under the Father. He wanted to go back home, right? Now, after the rebellion against God, at some point of time, we too all reach this point of realization that without God, we become miserable on our own. We need God. Indeed, we are far better off in God's hands than in our own control. I remember in my teenage years, I, didn't, I was not a Christian until I was 17. For some reason, even though I never went to church, in my heart, there was a yearning for you know, someone greater than I am. God, I need God. That's not my only experience. I mean, there are other plenty of teenagers too, including there was a gentleman whose name was Robbie Zacharias, a wonderful renowned uh, evangelist, internationally known, who passed on to eternal life recently. Anyway, when he was in the teenage years himself, not that he struggled, his family was well-to-do. It's just that he, he, he couldn't find any meaning and purpose in his life whatsoever. So he tried to kill himself, and after he you know, didn't make it, thank God, when he survived, and someone gave him a copy of the Bible. That's where he found God, that's where he found Jesus Christ as Savior, and that's where he found meaning and purpose in his life. You see, rebellion and realization. And third stage is repentance. After you realize that, uh-oh, I need to go back to God, then you need to repent. The prodigal son, for example, was ashamed of what he had done. He thought to himself, I quote, I have sinned against heaven and in my father's sight. He was so remorseful that he didn't think of himself worthy to be received back into his father's family as son. He would rather be just happy to be considered one of father's servants. That's what, what he was going to ask his father. So one day, despite of his shame and guilt, he decided to return to his home, to his father, right? He got up and started his journey homeward, one step, second step, and so forth. Nothing could stop him from going back home. Imagine this, though. Let's say the prodigal son felt so sorry for what he had done, yet he was too ashamed to go back to his father and indeed never took the first step toward him. Imagine that he stayed there at the pig farm until he died. Spiritually speaking, it means he had remorse, yet had not repented. You see, repentance, listen very carefully, repentance is twofold. Remorse and return. Let's say I've done something wrong in the sight of God and against people. To feel guilty and sorry about what I have done is one thing. And that's the only first half of repentance. The second half is more important. I would call change. Turn around, return to God, the Heavenly Father. Anyone can be overwhelmed with guilt, shame, and with Satan's accusations. Yet if they remain right there, failing to return and turn around from sin and going into the right direction, it is no longer repentance, folks. Remorse is only half of the repentance. Complete turnaround, 180 degrees, is the other half of repentance. And that completes the repentance. Here's an example. Let's say you and I 
you know, from South New Jersey, we are heading north to New York City by train. Well, about a year and a half, hour and a half <laughs> hours later, and you looked out and you see the sign Washington DC. And you say, wait a minute. Washington DC is southwest of New Jersey. So I'm on the wrong, wrong direction. So what do you do? As soon as you realize that you're on the wrong train, you need to get off at the next station. And, you know, just go across the tracks and wait for the train that goes north, right? That's turnaround, 180 degrees. And that completes the repentance. Rebellion, realization, and repentance. Okay? The last one is restoration. As soon as the father saw his son walking toward him, he was filled with compassion. In the past two Sundays, I talked about compassion, right? First of all, the compassion, I said, was your bowels, guts. The Hebrew people, and uh, also in the time of Jesus, they use the expression of when your guts were moved, that means that the innermost seat of your emotions was stirred up with compassion. That's what it is here. It's the same compassion as Jesus had when he looked outside the multitude, crowds, thousands of people, didn't have anything to eat. So with five loaves and two fish, he fed them 5,000 plus people, right? That's when he felt compassion that, oh, I'm sorry that they're hungry, okay? The same compassion we also talked about last Sunday's sermon about the Good Samaritan when he saw the half-dead man lying on the ground bleeding. That's the same compassion talking about him. So the father's emotion was deeply, in a good sense, disturbed with what? Compassion for his son. So he ordered the ring. Ring is here, right? Ring is the symbol of sonship, heirship. To be placed back in the hand of his son and robe and sandals were brought in as well. It means the complete restoration of the son's status in the family. No longer a prodigal, no longer a servant, but a rightful heir in the family. Furthermore, the father threw a party to celebrate the return of his dead son, now alive, the return of the lost, yet now found. In the same way, when we first believed in Jesus and repented of our sins, our broken relationship with God, or the dead relationship with our Heavenly Father was completely restored and joyfully celebrated among God's angels in the presence of God. And our spirit was dead before then. Now it was once dead, became live again. You see, the best part of the gospel is this. Joy and celebration in heaven on the return of a sinner. So folks, when you and I first became a born-again believer, genuinely sorry for our sins before God, and took the first step toward Heavenly Father in repentance, 180 degrees turnaround, an angel in heaven at the time, in the presence of God, have thrown a welcome back party on your behalf and mine. Now the party in heaven is still going on, folks, every day, every month, and everywhere in the world, wherever the prodigal return to the Heavenly Father. In America, in China, in Africa, in India, at home, and in jail, you name it, everywhere where the gospel is preached. Let's not forget, folks, we had our own celebrations for some of us years ago, others just like yesterday. Heavenly 
quality, welcoming us back into God's family. Now it is our turn, and we are called to bring our lost brothers and sisters in Christ back into God's fold. When they return to God, you and I will join the heavenly party, okay, with angels in the presence of God, we're all celebrating their return to God's family. As the Father welcomed the prodigal son. Restoration to the heirship. Is there such a thing? Eternal inheritance of life forever in the presence of God. Let's pray.